All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Rachel puts together a treatment package containing a DRO, a response cost procedure, and a FCT intervention. Prior to starting the treatment package, Rachel tries each intervention individually and then begins the package as a whole. What did Rachel use? So we're looking at Rachel's behavior, and what do we know so far about Rachel's behavior? Well, we know she put together a treatment package, which is important. This is a treatment package. So these three interventions, the DRO, response cost, FCT, are part of a package. However, before she started the package, she tried each intervention individually, meaning we're looking at some sort of component analysis, right? Because with the component analysis, we have a treatment package. Don't get it confused with the comparative analysis where you're comparing different things, but they aren't part of the same package. When all of your interventions are part of one package, it's going to be a comparative analysis. Now, more specifically, what type of comparative analysis? Because if we look at our answer choices, we have add-in analysis, dropout analysis, parametric, and comparative analyses. We know it's not D. We know it's not a comparative analysis because it is a treatment package. We know it's not a parametric analysis because a parametric analysis examines dosage or examines how much of something. So we have to look at add-in or dropout analyses. And these are type of component analyses. Within, with an add-in analysis, we're doing what Rachel is doing. We're trying each intervention individually and then using the package as a whole. The dropout is essentially reversed, where you're taking one piece of the package out and looking at the data of the results from removing one of those pieces. Not what Rachel did here. She tried each intervention first and then began the package as a whole. So what did Rachel use? She used an add-in analysis, which is a type of component analysis. After four weeks of intervention, data indicate that the client's tantrum behavior has decreased significantly with little variability over the weeks. The behavior analyst is excited to tell the team the news. However, when the behavior analyst tells stakeholders what the data show, the stakeholders are still unhappy and say they don't notice any change in behavior. Is the intervention considered effective at this point? Now, this is an interesting question. We're looking at this idea of effective. Our interventions need to be effective. There has to be meaningful change in the client's life. Just because the data change don't mean it's effective. Doesn't mean the intervention is always effective. In this case, our data indicate tantrum behavior has decreased significantly with little variability over the weeks. That seems like a great thing, right? So the analyst is so excited to tell the team the news. But the problem is the stakeholders say they don't notice any change in behavior. Now, why is that an issue? Well, it's the stakeholders' lives we're worried about, right? Because that client is affecting their lives. So when we work with, when we work with clients, and in this case, we consider our learners the client, we're not only worried about them, but we're worried about the environment around them, especially for stakeholders who have an interest in that person's outcomes in their lives. So regardless of what your data show, if those stakeholders aren't happy and they don't notice any change, is your intervention effective? A, yes, data indicate the behavior decreased following the intervention. That may be true, but the stakeholders don't notice it and they seem unhappy. Could it be that the data are wrong? 100%. Could it be the stakeholders are observing something different? 100%. So because the stakeholders are still unhappy, because they have not noticed a change, we can't consider this effective. So let's look at B. No, the data were inaccurate regarding the behavior decrease. Well, we don't know that for sure. Data can be accurate, but the stakeholders still don't notice, notice the change. They're still unhappy. It's not effective. C, no, the stakeholders did not observe a change. It doesn't matter what our data show. It doesn't matter what we're observing. If the stakeholders aren't feeling it, then it's not effective because we are working on their lives not just our client's life, but the stakeholder's lives. And if the stakeholder's lives are not changing in a meaningful way, our intervention is not effective. 
D, yes, the stakeholder report is subjective and not objective. That may be, but stakeholder reports are one of those instances where those that subjectivity still matters probably more than others, right? When we're observing as analysts or technicians, we are being objective and we have to be objective. Stakeholder opinion matters because again, it's their life, it's their child or patient or student or whoever it is, it's affecting them. If they're not seeing change, our intervention is not effective. So no, the stakeholders did not observe a change. Monica wants Chandler to start putting his dishes in the right part of the sink instead of the left part. She decides she is going to put a piece of blue painter's tape on the right side and hopes that Chandler will start to put his dishes there. What type of prompt is Monica using? All right, let's think about this. We're looking at Monica's prompting behavior. Let's think about what Monica wants to achieve. She wants Chandler to put his dishes in the right part of the sink and not the left. Now, what does she do to try to encourage that behavior? She puts this piece of painter's tape on the right side. So let's say this is our painter's tape on this right side. So the hopes is Chandler walks in, sees the sinks, and he sees the blue tape, and he puts the dishes in the right side. Now, what type of prompt will we consider that? A, a gestural prompt. Well, it's not a gestural prompt, right? Because Monica's using this painter's tape. She's not gesturing. She's not using motor movements. She's using this actual stimuli, right? Adding it to the situation to prompt Chandler. So would it be B, a within stimulus prompt, or C, a between stimulus prompt? And what's the difference? Oh, within stimulus prompt, we're acting on the stimulus itself. In this case, the sink is our stimulus. A within stimulus prompt would be changing the size of the sink, changing the color of the sink. Whereas a between stimulus prompt, you're adding something to the situation that's affecting the response and the stimulus. In this case, our blue painter's tape is being added to the sink. So we're not actually changing the sink itself, we're just adding something to the situation in order to evoke Chandler's behavior. So what we're using is a between stimulus prompt. And is it D, a positional prompt? Well, a positional prompt, we would be moving the sinks around, which we're not doing. We're not manipulating that stimulus exactly. We're just adding a blue piece of blue painter's tape in hopes that Chandler will put the dishes where they go. So the type of, of type of prompt we're using is a between stimulus prompt. Max keeps to himself for the most part, but when given a direct instruction, will engage in disruptive behavior and non-compliance. Max's teacher believes that is likely a result of counter-control. What would be best to treat is counter-control. Now, we don't talk about counter-control a lot, and we don't use it a ton in practice, but for the sake of being thorough, we're just going to go through it pretty quickly. Counter-control is typically an emotional reaction or aggressive reaction to an aversive or to be when given a direct instruction more or less. So just picture a student or learner when presented with punishment or when presented with a task or direct instruction, they try to control the situation because of the perceived lack of control through emotions or aggression. So that's what Max is doing here. He, he's given a direct instruction. He becomes disruptive. He becomes non-compliant. And so if Max's teacher thinks it's counter control, where Max is trying to regain control, how would we treat counter control? Well, think about it simply. If the issue becomes the learner or participant doesn't believe they have control, how could we treat that? We would want to give them some sort of control. So let's look at A, increase the use of consequences to reduce the disruptive behaviors. Sure, right? We could use punishment or extinction to reduce disruptive behaviors, but that doesn't address the need for control from Max. And now be very careful with counter control. Control is not a function. And don't let anyone tell you it is. Control is not a function. Counter control is something on its very own. So be very careful about this term, right? We're doing this to be thorough, but be very careful about counter control. B, give Max more choices and allow him to have a say in his activities. Good. With B, Max regains some of that control. B looks pretty good. C, use a fixed reinforcement schedule to reduce uncertainty. Well, again, does not help with the counter control aspect. And then D, ignore Max's disruptive behaviors to reduce attention seeking. That again, might reduce the behavior, but we don't, we're not addressing this need for control through counter control from Max. So the way we're addressing it, given our options would be 
give Max more choices, allow him to have a say in his activities. You receive a report from a technician on your team that another technician is letting the client take longer breaks than what is prescribed and that it is now affecting the other sessions. When you go to supervise a technician, you don't see anything wrong with the breaks that are given. What could possibly be occurring? This is a very good applied question because as an analyst, personnel management is one of your main roles, especially when you're managing a team of technicians. Now, we trust our technicians. We, we need to respect our technicians and treat them right because they're crucial to service. But when your technicians are reporting things to you, got to engage in philosophical doubt. If this technician says another technician is letting a client take longer breaks, and then you don't see anything wrong with the breaks when you go out and supervise, what are some things that might be happening here? A, the first technician's report was inaccurate. That is totally possible. It is completely possible that first technician was wrong. Should we jump to that conclusion without more information? No, but it is a possibility. B, the supervised technician is experiencing reactivity. This is also possible. When you show up, the technician who was given the wrong, who was allegedly providing the wrong breaks, responds to you showing up and does what? Well, now they do what they're supposed to do. C, the supervised technician is doing breaks correctly today. That could also be maybe just by chance, breaks are correct on that day. All three of these things are an option. And so how would you determine what's really going on? Well, more data, more supervision. That's what your job is. Collect data, supervise, use that data, use that observation to make decisions. So what could possibly be occurring? D, all the above. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Subscribe for all of our updates. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.